Well, I consider it an honor at any time to preach in this pulpit. Um, appreciate Dan and the elders. And we're looking at Psalm 23. If y'all go ahead and turn there. It's a familiar text. And I will read it this morning, and then we'll pray. This is the Word of God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You just prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word and our time this morning. Let's pray. On the evening of September 10th, 2001, American Todd Beamer and his wife had just returned from a trip to Italy. He could have taken a flight that night from Newark, New Jersey to San Francisco, but he decided to leave for his business trip the next morning in order to spend some time with his family. On September 11th, he left the airport aboard United Flight 93. At 9.25 a.m., his flight was above eastern Ohio, and its pilot radioed Cleveland controllers to inquire about an alert that had been flashed on his cockpit computer screen to beware of cockpit intrusion. Three minutes later, Cleveland controllers could hear screams over the cockpit's open microphone. Moments later, the hijackers took over the plane's controls, disengaged the autopilot, and told passengers, keep remaining sitting, we have a bomb on board. Beamer and the other passengers were herded into the back of the plane. The curtain between first class and second class had been drawn, at which point Beamer saw the pilot and co-pilot lying dead on the floor, just outside the curtain. Within six minutes, the plane changed course and was heading for Washington, D.C., Several of the passengers made phone calls to loved ones who informed them about the two planes that had crashed into the World Trade Center. Beamer tried to place a call through a phone located on the back of a plane seat, but was routed to GTE air phone supervisor, Lisa Jefferson. With FBI agents listening in on their call, Beamer informed Jefferson that hijackers had taken over United 93, that one passenger had been killed along with two pilots. He also stated that two of the hijackers had knives and that one appeared to have a bomb strapped around his waist. When the hijackers veered the plane sharply south, Beamer briefly panicked, exclaiming, We're going down! We're going down! Following this, the passengers and flight crew decided to act. According to accounts of cell phone conversations, Beamer, along with others, formed a plan to take the plane back from the hijackers. Passengers and flight attendants discussed their options and they all voted to storm the cockpit and take over the plane. Beamer told Jefferson that the group was planning to jump on the hijackers and fly the plane into the ground before the hijackers could be followed through. Hijackers' plane could be followed through. Beamer recited the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm with Jefferson, prompting others to join in. Beamer told Jefferson, if I don't make it, please call my family and let them know how much I love them. After this, Jefferson heard muffled voices and Beamer clearly answering, Are you ready? Okay, let's roll. These were Beamer's last words to Jefferson. Todd Beamer and others like him saved countless lives by making sure the plane did not crash into Washington, D.C., but in a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Where did Beamer and others find the strength for such a courageous act? Well, you know, don't you? In the Lord and in His Word. Specifically, the Lord's Prayer and the 23rd Psalm. This Psalm, no more inspired than the rest of the Scriptures, but God in His sovereignty and His kindness has set this one apart in ways that many have appreciated throughout the history of the church. As a matter of fact, so many martyrs died quoting this Psalm that Augustine could call it the hymn of the martyrs. And it is the psalm of the great shepherd. So today what I want to do is I want to just kind of 
let you breathe and just enjoy the heavenly air of a heavenly shepherd that takes care of us all the time. He's always there for us. You see, what I find out is the early church, you know what one of the things that, that drew people to Christians? It was really two things. Number one was their love, that they would gladly even give their, lay down their lives for unbelievers. But the second trait was their incredible joy. They had joy in the midst of suffering, joy in the midst of death. How is that even possible? Unbelievers were so drawn to that in believers. And yet, too many times when I look in the mirror in the morning, and when I look at you, we don't look half as joyful as we used to be. I mean, life can be hard, and it gets the best of us sometimes. And yet, I want us today to just encourage us as we look into the shepherd's faith that we want to be like him, and we see all the benefits that he has given us. So, we will call this structure, the sermon here, Nine Benefits to Having the Lord as Your Shepherd which would get me fired as a preaching professor, I'm letting you know. Uh, but the Puritans would appreciate that. If you ever read an old Puritan sermon, they've got like 25 points. Of course, they had two-hour sermons. I won't do that to you today. But we're going to look at nine benefits that believers have because the Lord is our shepherd. Now, before we go there, I should qualify something else. When you think shepherd, you think perhaps of the occupation of working with sheep. But there's three different ways that the Bible speaks of shepherds, and I'll explain those before we begin. Number one, shepherds were leaders. Uh, not just in Israel. This is actually an ancient concept. Even the pagans, Hammurabi being one of them, you probably learned of this back in school, the Code of Hammurabi. Uh, he called himself a shepherd to the sheep. So it's, it's kind of in the human psyche. We think of ourselves as sheep, which are pretty dumb characters. Uh, but we need shepherds. And so even in the Bible, the, uh, the, the scripture speaks about leaders of Israel being the shepherds. We also see shepherds in another case, and that is with, um, with people called pastors. The word, Latin word for shepherd is pastorum. It's just a transliteration uh, of, the, of the word in Greek. Uh, so it's basically, it means the one who helps take care of the sheep. In every congregation, there should be a kind of plurality of shepherds or overseers or elders. And that's what we have here at the chapel. And finally, the third thing is we see the Lord when we think of the shepherd, the good shepherd. He's also called the great shepherd or the chief shepherd. Um, that's Jesus Christ. And when we see Psalm 23, I want to show you all that's Christ. Ultimately, when he refers to himself as the good shepherd, he's drawing the attention of the people in the first century back to this Psalm 23 motif. And I hope that you will see it today. I will answer one question. When was the first time God was referred to as the shepherd? Do you know who first said that? The guy who is known as the big deceiver in the Old Testament. He was a kind of a big, scary, sinful character named Jacob. Right? He reminds me of myself in too many ways. And hopefully, if you look at your sin, you will see that in yourself as well. He's the first guy that calls God his shepherd. He, as he's blessing Joseph on his deathbed, he says this, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day. There he is. There's the shepherd. And so when David pins this, remember, David himself is a shepherd. And the Spirit inspires him to write this, that ultimately, David, you're not the shepherd. God is the shepherd. So let's take a look. Let's look at these nine benefits to having the Lord as your shepherd. Chapter 23 of Psalms, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, when I was a little kid, I read this, and I didn't understand it. And maybe you don't either when you think, I shall not want. I want things all the time. Right? I, I saw some German Lugers the other day. I'd like to purchase one of these guns. I want it. So that can't be what it's referring to. I really prefer the way the Net Translation Bible describes it. And it says this, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. That's really the picture. Is you don't have to have anything because you have the shepherd. It speaks about this in the New Testament. Psalm 4, rather, Philippians 4, verse 19. My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You may have these wants. 
You always have wants, but you don't have any needs. Paul writes this in 1 Timothy 6, 8. He says, if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Right? And some of you naysayers in here are going, wait a second. Suppose I'm starving to death. Right? Then, I, then I'm not content. Or maybe I'm about to be killed for my faith. It's, it doesn't sound like Psalm 23 verse 1 works for me. Au contraire. It does work for you. Let me tell you what Justin Martyr said. He was a guy who, his last name was not Martyr, but he was killed for his faith, so they call him Justin Martyr. In 165 A.D., he talks to the people who are about to kill him, about to behead him, and he says, you can kill us, but you cannot hurt us. That's the theme, y'all, of Psalm 23. You can do whatever you want to the sheep because we have a shepherd, all right? And so I don't need anything. I lack nothing. So the first benefit of having the Lord as your shepherd is, number one, my shepherd makes me lack nothing. Now that we've got sermon notes, I'll need to see those before we leave today, okay? I'm just letting you know. No, I'm kidding. That's, that's helpful. My shepherd makes me lack nothing. Let's take a look at what else. Verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. The second benefit we have with Christ as our shepherd is my shepherd gives me food and rest. I could ask for hands right now, but I would love to know how many of y'all thank the Lord for allowing you to sleep last night. Was that a big kind of the top shelf item for you? For some of you it was. But for many of us, I didn't give it a second thought. I mean, he gives me sleep every night. He gives me food every day, things that I don't even thank him for. He's so good to me. Now, for this, for the sheep at that time, going back to that idea, uh, they're eating in green pastures. And when you have green pastures for sheep, that's, that's a good thing. That means there's plenty to eat. Shepherds have hard lives, but sheep, not really. Well, I guess they get slaughtered, so that's not exactly true. But ultimately, their life is made up. They eat green pastures in the morning, and then the shepherd takes them out, and then they kind of sleep for the afternoon. Not bad. But here we have this shepherd who leads them to these, to these green pastures in quiet waters. When you think quiet waters here, think of uh, gently flowing waters, which are not common in Judea, which is kind of a dry area of Israel where David was living. But when David thought of his Savior, his shepherd, he thinks he feeds me and he gives me times of rest. He doesn't do it all the time, but he gives me places to rest. You know, I will note this, and I think you should too. This is something, y'all, that Christ does in this life and in the next one as well. Revelation 7, it says this, that Jesus will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water. Think about this. For eternity, Jesus Christ is still leading us. It's not like we get to heaven and we're, okay, I'm on my own now. No, even when we get to heaven, he's still going to be leading us to water. What's that going to be like? Living water. I don't know. It's going to be a pretty sweet deal. Verse 3. Let's see what else he does. He restores my soul. Literally in the Hebrew, it reads this. He causes life to return. Causes life to return. So the third benefit that we have as, as he is our shepherd is my shepherd gives life to my soul. Now that's interesting. See, because he does it in two ways, by my thinking. He does it B.C., that means before Christ. What God did for you at a, at a particular time and place, if you are in Christ today, if you know Jesus as your Savior, what, according to Ezekiel 36, he took out, spiritually speaking, he took out this heart of stone that was dead to the things of God, and he put in a heart of flesh. He gives you the gift of faith and repentance. He has you be literally born again. And you believe you're so drawn to the Savior that you could have cared less about at one time. But now you see the beauties of Christ and you're like, I have to follow him. He's mine. And that's what God did. That's what he does for the life of, a, of an unbeliever that becomes a believer. What I'll say you also is that he also causes life to return for a believer. In a sense, are there times where you feel incredibly dry in your spiritual life? You're reading the word and you close it and you're like... Nothing. Am I even a believer? At times like that, the Lord in His kindness causes life to return. Don't think it came from yourself. 
No, you get encouraged. You start to study the scripture more. He, he draws you back. Remember, aren't we prone to wander? Of course we are. Of course we are. So he causes life to return in us. And notice, uh, he says, continuing on in verse 3, he guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The fourth benefit for having Jesus as your Savior and shepherd is that he, my shepherd leads me in his paths. In his paths. Psalm 31 3 says this You are my rock and my fortress, and for your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. Whenever you see the name of Jesus, like we are supposed to pray in his name, the idea is that we're praying in his power, in his character. And note what he's saying here He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Can I give you a dangerous question? Let me give you a dangerous question. And my guess is you got asked it as a kid. And I bet you've asked countless number of kids the same question. You know what it is? It's not helpful for the Christian, but I'll give it to you anyway. It's this question. What do you want to be when you grow up? And you go, well, that's harmless. Well, it, it can be. But certainly it can be very selfish as well. What do you want to be when you grow up? Think about that for a second. God is eclipsed from that whole picture altogether. The Puritans would never have asked those questions. The Puritans had their own. They weren't always the most godly people, but something they understood was how work and life could be lived for God's glory. And so they would ask a question very similar to this. How do you think the Lord has crafted you to serve in his kingdom? See the difference? How's the Lord crafted you specifically to serve in his kingdom? So the idea is that, yes, God has given you gifts and he's given you desires. And there's nothing wrong with those if they're, if they're you know, not selfish. But ultimately, how are you going to use those for Christ? You see, because ultimately, some of us need to remember, even as adults, this life is not about you. It's not about you. I've got this dog named Luther. He always thinks that, I don't know. I exist for him. Now, my cat knows that I exist for her. But the dog, I expect more out of. No, I tell Luther all the time. I said, no. Well, I do talk to him. Confuse that. But the way it works is that I, hear, I have you here for pr protection. Now, he's kind of a weenie dog, so he's not going to be very protection. But I also have him here for fellowship. But he exists for me. I don't exist for him. And I think we miss that up with God. We think that somehow he, he exists for me. And the Lord makes it clear, no, you exist to bring me glory, to honor me. But we don't do that, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Verse 4, we'll see the fifth aspect of the benefit. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. So the fifth aspect is my shepherd protects me in trouble. Now, don't mistake it. I didn't say my shepherd protects me from trouble, but he protects me in trouble. You see, the, first, the, the person of David is writing as a Bethlehem shepherd. He had to be thinking of all the dangers he had as a shepherd boy. Thieves that wanted to steal the sheep, wolves, bears, and lions. He seemed to have killed them as well as they tried to steal the sheep. But what's that look like for us? What's it look like for us regarding fears that we have? Well, maybe when you go to the doctor a second time and he said, you know, let's go ahead and do an x-ray on that. That looks strange. That looks peculiar. And he takes a look at it and then comes back and says, you know, I'm sorry, but that is cancer. All of a sudden, everything stops for us, right? Or maybe you hear you've got heart disease and we can't fix this. Or, or maybe it's not medical. Maybe you found that your spouse is cheating on you. has left you. Or your kids are so out of control. How, how did this happen? And, and maybe even worst case, you're dealing with death. How do you deal with this? Well, as a believer, we can, we can bank on many things. And I'll give you a few of them. Psalm 112 verse 7 says this regarding a believer. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. doesn't mean bad news doesn't come. Bad news is coming. 
But the point of it is that he's not banking his happiness, his joy on his bad news, but he's banking on the Savior. A guy named Samuel Rutherford, who is a contemporary of John Bunyan, you all have read of Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan was put in prison for the gospel in England. Samuel Rutherford was put in prison in Scotland for the gospel. So he wrote some letters to people, and he actually later became a book called Samuel Rutherford's Letters. And listen to what he writes about the troubles of this life. He says this, Our little time of suffering is not worthy of our first night's welcome home to heaven. Right? Our little time of suffering is not worthy of our first night's welcome home to heaven. I'll read to you a story about somebody else, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cole. Um, as many of you know, sadly, our nation has a um, stain, quite honestly, for things of sins, such as racism, uh, especially toward African Americans. There's a book called uh, God's Long Summer by Charles Marsh that he writes about some of these horrific events. Um, especially the 1960s, where civil rights movement was occurring, Ku Klux Klan was rampant in the South, in particular. And the writes a story about Mr. and Mrs. Cole, a godly African-American couple that were coming from church that evening and were just returning home. And there was a pickup that came right back behind them and ran them off the road. And it was some Klansmen. And they took Mr. Cole out and they began to beat him mercilessly. It says, repeatedly striking blows to his neck and back with an iron tire jack and kicking his head and hip until he lay motionless in the dirt parking lot. Such savagery did, still did not satisfy one of the assailants who warned Mr. Cole that unless he could give the white men some useful information, he would be killed. Mrs. Cole, note what she does. She pled with the Klansmen to stop their torture, hoping against hope that she could reason with a mob. He can't say nothing. He's unconscious, she said. Her memory of what happened next is worth documenting at length. She said, at that moment, I began to pray. I was praying very hard. I was just praying, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Don't let them kill my husband. And then I heard a voice sound like a woman scream down the road, just a little piece below me. And then a man walked up with a club. And I continued saying, Lord, have mercy. And he drew back to hit me. And I asked this man that was standing by him, would he allow me to pray? The one on the right side says, if you think it'll do you any good, you'd better pray. The one on the left says, it's too late to pray. But I said, let me pray. <laughs> And I stretched out my hands. Then I started praying to God that he would spare my husband, that God would spare his life. I kept praying and praying. And then I remember to him, it just fell into my heart. And I said, Father, I stretch out my hand to thee. No other help I know. If thou will, will withdraw thy help from me, where shall I go? That's what I prayed. And when I said that, the man who was beating my husband just stopped. Someone said, leave him living and I went there and I tried to lift my husband up once, then again, I couldn't do it. And I tried a third time and he just fell back to his knees. Finally, he stood up and I drug him to where the car was and I put him in the car. And about that time, the crowd of white men just disappeared. I didn't know nothing else to do but call on God. And God just got in the midst. God just got in the midst. That's the picture we have here. God's in the midst. He's there. He's taking care of you. But what about death? What if it's death? Well, even there. Deuteronomy 31.8, The Lord himself is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. There's a decent theologian here, a guy named Dan Duncan, who says it pretty well when he did it on Psalm 23. He says this, Referring to Christ, he does not lead us anywhere that he has not gone first. He's been in the grave before us. He's defeated death. It has been disarmed. If the greatest enemy has been disarmed, what about the lesser enemies? They're not to be feared either. Some of you may not know this, but one of the reasons why Jesus came to the earth, you know what it was? To get rid of our fear of death. It's described in Hebrews 2 as a lifelong slavery of the fear of death. And he got rid of it for us. 
God cares for his sheep. You need to know that. You need to know that he cares for his sheep in life and in death. Perhaps even especially in death. Notice what the scriptures say. Psalm 116 verse 15. It said, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Even Paul, when the Lord... Uh, put it upon him to write 2 Timothy 4. He's, what is he writing about to Timothy? I'm going to die. I'm being poured out like a drink offering. My time is, basically my time is up. I'm going home. But notice what he says in verse 18 of chapter 4. He says this, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into His heavenly kingdom. This is right before he's about to get beheaded. Now, I don't know about y'all, but my understanding of rescue and safely don't go hand in hand with beheading. And so my encouragement to you and to me is this. Maybe your definitions are wrong. Not his. You see, as a believer, we know that even if we get beheaded, the Lord is rescuing us. He's taking us to heaven. You can kill us, but you can't hurt us. And not only that, but he's going to deliver us safely. Doesn't look like safety. It is, though. So, number five, as I said, my shepherd protects me in trouble. How does he do this? We say, it says in verse four, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And that's number six. My shepherd comforts me. You see, shepherding in ancient Israel is very different from shepherding in America. If you were to take sheep, there's no fences in the ancient days, uh, and you would basically, so that means the sheep are totally dependent on the shepherd for food, water, grazing, and protection. So what's the shepherd use to protect the sheep? He uses two tools. One of them is called the shepherd's rod, which is a club that he would keep at his side. And that, with that, he would stave off attacking animals. And then another one was a really tall stick called a staff, and that was his walking stick. And it kept the sheep away from going over the cliff many times. So a shepherd uses his two tools to, sh to assure the sheep of his presence and to calm them of their nerves. Um, for a believer, what does this look like? Well, I, I'd like to think as a believer, what is the shepherd's club that Jesus carries? I like to think it is, that is God's sovereignty, that he does not allow the wild animals of this life to touch me. And if he does, he knows it's for my good, Right? And he can beat them away at any time he wants to. And the staff, for me, is a picture of God's love for me. You see, it's not enough that God is great and God is good. As a believer, you've got to believe that God loves you. You know, maybe God is great and God is good and he loves you all. But if he doesn't love me, then it's hard to make through life. No, 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 no. He's sovereign, but he loves us too, right? So he comforts me, even in trials. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The presence of my enemies. We'll talk about that in a moment. But here we see the valley of the shadow of death leads to a banquet hall. This may be a rich shepherd's large tent where he serves a feast. So what is this referring to for a believer? Well, I'm not sure. Jesus may refer to it in Luke 12. He'll say this, Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. I think Jesus is referring to something called the marriage supper of the lamb at the end of time. That strangely enough, use a little holy imagination, if you will. Jesus himself prepares to serve us. What? We're supposed to be serving him. No, no. Right here, he's serving us. What does he come alongside with big goblets of wine, pour it in, or he brings in steak? What's this going to look like? I have no idea. But it's worthwhile to focus on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth, right? As this tells us to do in Colossians. So this shepherd serves the sheep. And notice this. How does he serve them? He serves them in the presence of my enemies. I've often wondered, what does that mean? Well, I think it means two things. Number one, it's this idea that the enemies of Christ cannot stop him from serving you. And I'm not referring to a health, wealth, gospel, you're going to be rich and famous. My point is that God is going to take care of you all throughout your days. And in the end, especially, 
Okay? We see here the idea they can't stop it. The enemies of Christ cannot stop him. Uh, But also, I think you have something alluded to this in Luke 13, verse 28. He looks at the people and he says to the enemies, he says, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see. Strange verb. Talking about the enemies, you will, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets at the kingdom of God. And there will be people from the east and west and north and south that will take their place at the table in the kingdom of God. The idea is that the Jews never expected the gospel to go to the Gentiles, the dogs, i.e. us. And Christ is making it very clear to him, beware, there will be weeping and gnashing because y'all will see this take place. I'm not certain how that works out, but perhaps this is what it's referring to. We are prepared a table in the midst of enemies. He continues on. He says, you have anointed my head with oil. Anoint here, you may think of it as suggesting kingship or perhaps the priesthood in the, in the scriptures. That is true, but it's a bit misleading if that's what you think here. I think it's most likely referring to this idea of as a divine host would refresh people as they came into their house, they would pour oil on their head prior to seating at the supper table. So the seventh benefit we see here is my shepherd hosts me, and he hosts me among enemies. Now what about this concept of anointing? Some of y'all get very uncomfortable with this at this point because it's so different from our backgrounds. Um, here, what it's referring to, at least back in the Middle East, it's really an ancient custom. It was practiced by the Egyptians and by Greeks and by Romans and also the Jews. Uh, a gentleman by the name of J.M. Freeman writes about it. And he says this, olive oil was used. It could be pure or mixed with spices. It was an act of hospitality towards a guest. In Luke 7, Jesus accuses Simon of lacking hospitality. He had no water for his feet. There was no kiss of greeting. And he also neglected to refresh his head with oil. This is what you would just do. Uh, The neglect of anointing, y'all, that was considered an act of mourning, sadness. But when you anoint somebody's head with oil, it says in the Psalms, that that's that's an act of gladness, an incredible joy. We're about to eat the feast. And so the, the idea of pouring oil on somebody's head, that happened right before you would sit down at the table and enjoy. So this is not just future. Note this. This is not just future. We need to remember as believers, God is working all things together for our good now, not just in the next life. I mean, last time I checked the scriptures, it's uh, Jesus said, hey, he who believes has, present tense, eternal life, right? Now. He goes further and he says in verse 5, my cup overflows. You may have even heard people say this before, my cup overflows. And you go, I like that phrase, but I have no idea what it means. Uh, My cup overflows. The word cup is a synecdoche. If you failed um, college English, then you may not know this term. Synecdoche is this concept. It's a part of something that stands for the whole of something. Part of something that stands for the whole of something. Um, For instance, Alan Angeles from Mexico, pretty well-to-do family. They had perhaps a few million uh, heads of cattle, okay? They called him Cowboy Allen. You'll have to ask him about that later. But a few million heads of cattle, you don't think of decapitated heads, do you? You think of cattle because that's the way you refer to it. That's a synecdoche, heads of cattle. If I, you go out and take a look at my rental car and you said, nice wheels, and I looked at you and said, you like the tires, huh? You would go, no. The car, nice wheels. So you're using synecdoches all the time. Why is that important? I'm going to show you. The cup here is symbolic of something that overflows. Okay? The idea is that overflowing with blessing. This cup of overflowingness. And it talks about here we have in a gentleman by the name of Captain Wilson. I'll tell you something that he wrote In a book called Oriental Customs, he writes about this. It happened in the 1800s for him where his cup overflowed. Let me show you. He said, I once had the ceremony performed on me in the house of a great and rich Indian in the presence of a large company. The gentleman of the house put a golden cup into my hands and he poured wine into it until it ran over. 
assuring me at the same time that it was a great pleasure to receive me and that I should find a rich supply of my needs in his house. So this picture, he, he's given him a gold cup and the guy just starts pouring wine and it starts overflowing. And I'm sure the guy's like, you know, is, is what I do. But the point of it is that I can waste all this on you. It's not a waste. It all belongs to me. All right? Your cup is overflowing because you are in Christ and Christ is in you. Verse 6, as we close, Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. Goodness. And you might be thinking at this point, oh, this is where I disagree with the text. Jeff, my days have been horrible. I, goodness is not following me. And I would say you're wrong. You see, Romans 8.28 makes it very clear, right? Makes it very clear that the goodness of God will follow us. For believers, there's nothing in life that happens to us that is not for our good. I'm not saying bad things don't occur, but even those bad things become good things. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. To who? To those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. I can't tell you the number of times that I've heard people on the TV say, I know that God causes all things to work together for good. And they just kind of stop it there. And I'll tell you something. For a believer, that's true. But for an unbeliever, God is not causing all things to work together for your good if you never come to Christ. He's causing all things to work together for your destruction because you have rejected His Son. If you come over to my house and you decide to kick my daughter, you won't be staying in my house. It's the way it works. How much more the God of the universe, you would kick his son to the curb because you ain't interested. You think he'll let you in his house? I think not. Goodness. Goodness follows us. What else follows us? Is the word loving kindness. This is an interesting word, and we don't know what to do with it, quite honestly. Because it's the Hebrew word chesed. And Miles Coverdale, in 1535, he translated into English and he called it loving kindness because he had a problem. As you and I have this problem, we can't translate that Hebrew word. It, it has too many definitions for it to make one word. And so he kind of combined loving and kindness and he made up his own word. It's pretty good. It's not a bad translation, but really has said it, it, it translates basically four different terms and it's kind of wrapped up in a bow. And, and the terms would be love, kindness, loyalty, mercy, love, kindness, loyalty, mercy. And the bow that you would put on top of this present that God has given his people would be it's called the covenant. You see, the way it works, the reason why you get those attributes from God is because you're in covenant with him. If you weren't in covenant with him, you wouldn't get loving kindness at all. But you are if you're in Christ. So what does it say here about goodness and loving kindness? It says, they will follow me. Now, some of y'all are hunters. Some of you do deer hunting. It's not what we're referring to here. This is more like rabbit hunting. You're running after the rabbit here, if you will. And much in the same way, the Lord is pursuing. He's chasing the one he loves. This is fascinating. The idea is that you will be blessed. You can't stop it from happening. You are my people. You can't escape Christ's desire and commitment to do you good. Do you know that? I'm going to say that again. You cannot escape Christ's desire and commitment to do you good. And that is the eighth component we have here. The eighth benefit is my shepherd pursues me with good gifts. I know, keep in mind, sometimes the packaging is not what we would want. Medical problems, social problems, familial problems. But ultimately, God is using that to make this sheep look like the shepherd. And finally, the last one, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What does this mean? Well, the ninth benefit is my shepherd lives with me and I live with him. Right? That's fully fulfilled in Revelation 21 where it says, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. God will be with us, right? Now, I would note this, y'all. It's not just future tense. Present. 
as Jesus is leaving the earth, He makes it very clear in Matthew 28, 20. Behold, I am with you always till the end of the age. The idea is I'm going to be with you forever. And if you become a believer in Jesus Christ, you can know that God is with you today. So if you're a believer, in conclusion, you've got nine benefits. I haven't even mentioned the fact that this shepherd would one day die for you. All right? It's not mentioned in the text, but we know it true. We'll talk about it in a moment. But note this, believer. The shepherd, he makes me lack nothing. He gives me food and rest. He gives life to my soul. He leads me in his paths. He protects me in trouble. He comforts me. He hosts me even among enemies. He pursues me with good gifts, and he lives with me. What kind of shepherd is this? What kind of God do we serve? And I'll go further. Wouldn't you want to tell others about this shepherd? Right? This is the shepherd of the sheep. Maybe some of you are not interested. I talked with one of you the other day. I mean, not one of you, but an unbeliever. My wife and I were in a four-car pileup here a couple of weeks ago. I can laugh about it because, well, I'm here. <laughs> and um, I know that God causes all things to work together for good. And maybe one of it was one of those reasons where I was picked up yesterday in a, uh, in a car by Enterprise. And a uh, lady was taking my daughter and I to, uh, to get a new uh, rental car. And so we drove along, and I just talked with her a little bit. And she said she was from that area. And I said, asked where she went to school. She told me. And I said, where, do you go to church anywhere? And she said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. And she told me the name of it. And I said, well, let me ask you this. And this is helpful if ever you want to go to the gospel with somebody, and I hope you do. I hope you want to tell people about the shepherd. Uh, I said, let me ask you this. What does your church teach about um, how a person is right with God? I mean, you know, we're, we're not great people. We, we don't do things right, and, and yet God is perfect. So, hmm, what makes, what does your church teach about what makes you right with God? And she said, well, I, we, um, we do confession. I mean, we confess our con confession, and um, I don't know, why, why don't you tell me? Which, in evangelical terms, is called slow pitch, right? <laughs> right? And I said, well, okay, sure I will. I said, first off, you should know this. Is I said, you know, let me give you the bad news first. God made us to glorify Him. That means to honor Him, to praise Him. And the problem with you and I is that we are sinners. Sin is anything you think, say, or do that's displeasing to God. And the Bible calls it out. It said, Romans 3.23, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. You were made to glorify God, but like you and me, we don't. And uh, I said, the problem gets worse, right? Because there's a payment coming at the end of your life. Romans 6.23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. You see, I looked over at her, I said, you're going to pay for your sins one day, and you're never going to be able to pay for them. Uh, so you're going to go to hell for eternity. And I, I tell you that, not just in sadness. And I said, but God in His kindness, in His loving kindness, would send His Son into the world to be born of a virgin. And that, then she began to connect a little bit like, oh, that's right, this is a Jesus character. Yeah, to be born of a virgin. Later on, He was, he was a man like every other man, but He wasn't. He was the God-man, right? And he, but He lived this perfect life. Later on, He would be crucified on the cross. Three days later, God would raise Him from the dead as perfect stamp of my approval. This is the one that the world should look to as the Savior. This is the one that they have to believe. You see, I told her, I said, Romans 5 eight, God demonstrates His own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So He didn't just die, He rose from the dead. And she goes, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, like she was familiar with that. And I said, but ultimately, a person that is right with God it's a person that comes to the place that they trust in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. Ephesians 2.8.9, it says, For by grace you're saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, that no one will boast. I said, I'll be honest with you. If we were to die, and I hope we don't, but if I were to stand before God and He were to say, Why should I let you into heaven? I would say, You shouldn't. I'm a sinner. I've done things wrong my entire life. 
But there's a man sitting right next to you. He's not just any man. He's the God man, Jesus Christ. And he died for me. Right? I say, one of these days, Christ is coming back and he's going to make all things new and he's going to judge the world. Right? He makes it very clear that he's going to do that. And um, I said, you're not ready. And she said out of the blue, she said, you know, I'm not really into, you know, the God stuff so much. I said, you know what? You may not be into it, but you're going to meet him someday. And um, you're not ready. There's some of you out here today that you're not ready. You're not into the God thing. It's a decent sermon. Let's move on. The fact of the matter, if you don't know Jesus is your shepherd, you will die today in your sins. It'll happen sometime in this life, and you will not meet God in the way that you would want to meet him. You'll meet him, but you'll meet him as an enemy, not as a friend, not as a son and daughter of the king. So come to him today. See, because I got to tell you this, that shepherd didn't just stay a shepherd, did he? He became a sheep in order to die for sheep. That's what he did for you. So if you don't know him, please come to him today. The question I'll close you with is, Jesus, your shepherd, is he yours? Please rise for the benediction. Hebrews 13, verse 20 and 21, puts it aptly, and this will be our prayer. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.